great being here. I'll do four things tonight. The first thing I'll do is I'll, I'll let you into to my profession and, and, and the world of investments. Very briefly, because we don't have that much time, uh, I'll share some insights and observations I've gleaned over the years. And, and I think they might be useful to you. Uh, it's really just my reflection. I'm now into my third decade of, of, of investing professionally. What I'll then do is I'll tell you how my approach to dealing with people is very different to, to the typical approach. Um, and I didn't realize this, but uh, I'll let you into that. And finally, I'll give you some practical considerations which you may or may not find useful. So once we get there, we'll see how things go. So let me go straight away. And there are apparently slides, so I'm not sure when the slides will come up, but my, my world is investments. And on, if you're an outsider looking into, into investments, it's glamorous. It's incredibly glamorous. And, and of course, it's popularized in, on TV, CNBC, Bloomberg, CNN, the movies. And, and it is a glamorous profession. So if you're smart, you're curious, you, you're intellectually curious, you love business, and, then, and you're very competitive, this is an industry that you could get into, which I guess probably talks about some of the things that made me get into it. Um, but it's also a very, very competitive environment. In fact, I would characterize it as a, as a competitive blood sport. Um, because there are highs and lows, and the lows are really, really, really low. So I'm not sure if there's a picture up here, if you, if you go to the next slide. And it doesn't come out very well, but you can see that I've chosen the bull run at Pamplona, because you know, as exciting as, and as exhilarating as it is, you can be gouged. And that's what markets are. And over my years in investment markets, I've experienced the highs, and the highs are high. You know, you do a lot of work, you think you found a mispricing in public markets where everybody, all the smartest brains in the world are looking. And then you have this knot in your stomach because you figure, you know, maybe I'm the dumbest guy in the room. And then you start doing the work and then you say, well, maybe I should invest before everyone else does. And you do. And when it works out, there's nothing like it. Because you think, oh, my word, all these smart people all over the world and I managed to figure this out, make money for my clients, and I feel great. I've experienced that many times. I've experienced the lows. I've also experienced the low of losing money. Losing money in a big way for myself and for clients. I've been gouged. I've stood in front of a client and the client says, well, for a guy who's so smart and has been around for two decades, I think you might just have done the dumbest thing in the world. And so there's lows. And the reason I wanted to tell you is that it's competitive. It's incredibly competitive. And when we get to the next slide, it's not only really competitive, but most people don't realize that underneath all of this, there are people. You see, you know, there are computers, and there are robo-advisors, and thankfully they haven't taken us over yet. <laughs> but most investment decisions are made by people. Which means that every single time, if you look at investments and finance, they don't tell you this when you study at university, it's people-intensive. So you think, oh, well, I know numbers, and I'll sit in a corner. No, no, it doesn't work that way because you're dealing with people all the time. And some people are nice and not so nice. And it turns out the smartest guys in the room, the guys who make the most money, are in fact actually quite dysfunctional human beings. I say that tongue in cheek because talent doesn't come in a nice neat package, does it? But every person was born somewhere and grew up somewhere and has a family and has a background, and has interests. So you can understand that, in fact, the people intensity means that I, um, there's a lot of opportunity to deal with people. So how does business, the investment business, and I'm not talking about the profession, because you know, like most professions, I'm talking about the investment business. How does it deal with people? And I've had the pleasure and sometimes displeasure of being an executive in big investment businesses. The way they deal with people is very different to a small business. So any small business, and particularly an investment business, is that if it's small, people matter. And in fact, you invest in them. But the bigger the business and the more successful the business is, the less people matter. And the more they are treated like commodities, because it says, well, they're all the same, homogenous. You know, you can replace someone. So when we go to the next slide, you'll see what I'm talking about is that it's a really a finance principle. So big business says, 
Can we make money? And literally it means that if I'm an executive of a big investment business, I go, how much money can we make out of Sue or John? Or how much money can we lose if Sue or John leaves and goes to a competitor? And if, if we're going to lose money, we pay this person a really big restraint to make sure they don't leave. And it doesn't matter if we don't like them because really actually they make a lot of money for us. And on the point of return on capital, which is a simple concept of how much money do I invest today for a return later, you say, if I invest time and energy in training someone, they'll just leave. So the question is, what's the least amount I can spend? So with that as background, how have I approached it? Now, I've told you I'm in my third decade and I arrived on the scene in the beginning and I walked in and I thought, oh, this is great. I have my dream job. Let's find out how this works. And I found out people were closed. Nobody told me a thing. I was expected to compete with everyone that had been around for 20 years on the same playing field. And I just couldn't understand that. You know, these were not foreigners. These weren't strangers. They were my teammates, but they didn't talk to me. So I discovered early on that actually this was a closed environment. And at that time I resolved. I didn't understand it, but I resolved that I was going to do it differently. Now, when I was a student, there was a verse, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. It's in the Bible, and it spoke about the multiplication system, which says, whatever you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, pass on to reliable men who will be able to teach others. So that stuck with me, and I think it was the thing that I decided. I decided I might not know much, but whatever I know, I will pour into every single person around me including telling the guy that arrives after me, guess what, nobody will help you, but come to me. I know just a little bit more than you, so I'll help you. <laughs> and over the years, as I gained in knowledge and insight, I literally poured myself into people all the time. And my approach has been, whatever I know, I want to share. I want to understand people. I'm genuinely curious about what makes people tick. Now. In case you're getting emotional, and I am emotional, this is purely an analytical pursuit. So don't, don't put me up there as being the super emotional guy. I'm not. I look at people and I see them as something that I have to analyze. I have to figure out where they come from, what makes them tick. The emotion is there, but it's not driven purely by emotion. So, you know, I'm not a stone. But the point is, is I'm trying to find out what makes people tick and how can I make them better. I've done that throughout my life. In some cases, it's worked out well. In other cases, it's worked out horribly. But I can tell you one thing. It's completely different to the way big businesses do, do it. And I have, I have suffered for it. But in the process, as I'll tell you later, I've had some incredible moments. So let's move to the next slide. So these are the practical considerations that you may find useful. The first is, it's not about charisma. You might really genuinely think I'm a charismatic guy. I'm an extrovert because I'm talking here and I seem quite comfortable. I just have a lot of practice over the years. It turns out, in fact, I'm not that. I'm quiet. <laughs> I like to observe. And if you want to be interested in people, the most important thing you need to do is pay attention, keep quiet, and observe. And I spend a lot of time doing that. The next thing is I don't pretend to be perfect. It's hard because, you know, in some cases, I've, I've made mistakes. And please, you know, when I was flying high and I was a top investment performing manager, I was, I was so caught up in my own importance, I really made some horrible mistakes. So please. But over time, the markets have humbled me, and I think God has taught me a lot of lessons. So I've tried and found that admitting to not being perfect works. If you were a leader of people, they can live with your perfections if you execute well. That's my feeling. In fact, they can say, gee, you know, we're really doing well here, even though Sam is really not good at X or Y. Or, and it's so liberating. Of course, it's rooted in the fundamental thing of grace. You know, just because God, in His grace and mercy, rescued me, being imperfect, means that every single thing I do <laughs> is rooted in that. So when people walk through the door, you know, if they're difficult, I should have grace, and I try to have grace. It's messy. Some of the people that I've been involved in, 
They've gone through horrible, messy things. Things that are ugly that cannot be aired in the front page of newspapers. But it's been worth it because people are always worth it. And, and to be honest, if God had that attitude, then I don't think any of us have a chance, would we? You have to sign up for forgiveness. Firstly, you need to be forgiven because you're not perfect. But you have to let it go. Remember Joseph? Joseph did so many good things for so many people and they just forgot about him. It turns out that you need to do that or else you walk around really feeling the world owes you and people are horrible. You have to let go. How does it land? What that means is if someone's not doing what you want them to do and they're not getting it, it's because you are not communicating well. <laughs> Which means that you need to find a way to figure out what, how the person understands things. Because you say, I told you 20 times, why didn't you do it? No, it doesn't work that way. People, you need to figure out what works for them. You'll be misunderstood, and then I have this OODA for opted, and I have 20 seconds. OODA is observation, orientation, decide, act, and opted is optimal time of delay. Which literally means, when it comes to people, sometimes you know what to do, but you want to wait so you can delay. I have, I have one more point, so I think I'll make it slightly over. There are other times when you observe and you act instantly. There are some people that, in fact, are quite disruptive, and you can be honest and truthful with them. And I think that that's been quite liberating because in the beginning of my leadership with people, I was scared to hurt people. But over time, I've learned that the truth consistently applied, good and bad, is the best way because people can deal with reality if they know that you are consistent. The final point is people rise to your expectations. In the last three years, I've gone through the worst time in my investment career. But up until last year, I had a team of people that in fact stood by me right up to the end. I don't know if you know what it's like, but if a sporting team does badly and the team is a toxic environment, people leave. Every single one of the members of the team will, were able to leave at any point, but they stayed. They absolutely rose way above my own expectations. If, if they said to me, Sam, I'm out of here, you let me down, I would have said, it's understandable. But they didn't. Why was that? Because it turns out I genuinely believed that they were great and they, they <coughs> rose way above my expectations. They are my friends, I admire them. And they've given me something that for all of the disappointments, I don't think I would ever have had if I didn't invest in people. So, I hope you enjoyed this. That's my story. Thanks.